Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another GIS 101 session. Um, just as a quick reminder, the purpose of these GIS 101 webinar ser series uh, is to present a non-technical overview of topics within GIS. Uh, the series was created to hi highlight the diverse field of expertise within our membership. Um, today we have Jim Meyer, Data Analytics and HPMS Manager with the Arizona Department of Transportation speaking with us about transportation within GIS. So I will turn it over to Jim. Hi. Well, hi, everyone. Um, we'll get started here. And uh, so, so basically, we're going to be talking about some of the basic fundamental parts of what a transportation state DOT organization does with, uh, with uh, GIS. So we'll get started here. Um, so some of the, the key points that are or areas of, of, of focus that a DOT at a state level has uh, pertains to these these uh, eight bullet items here. And uh, albeit it's not the limit of what we do, but it's the, the most predominant aspects of what a, a state DOT GIS uh, group does. So the first one that um, is probably the most important is uh, linear referencing systems. For, for DOTs, this is basically the foundation for all of our transportation data. And what it does for us is it gives us um, the ability to have one source of truth. So there's not more than one geometry representing uh, transportation facilities. Uh, it gives us a way to have a, a common location between uh, various business units and we all use the same referencing for, for locating our, our business data. Uh, it allows us also to speak the same language or at least translate how we talk about locations along the road. So, so basically what LRS is, is, is a methodology by way by which you can have many ways to locate data. And in doing so, it gives us the uh, ability to support a variety of business processes from operations to maintenance and inventory. Um, the next area of, of prime focus that DOTs have is, is for roadway characteristics. Um, most people don't really see these things as they drive the road or at least they don't know what they're called but but you know these are these are items that you would normally see on every roadway um, sometimes in limited degrees depending on the type of road that it is um, but you know obviously you see the number of lanes things like auxiliary lanes or um, connectors or or acceleration deceleration ramps uh, that that sort of thing you know, shoulders, what's on the side of the road, medians, how wide it is, are there passing lanes, uh, dual carriageway, basically, is, it, is, is, it, is the two directions of travel separated. Um, these, these are types of things that we, as DOT folks, uh, uh, do is keep track of this because it's an important um, uh, piece of data for, for doing assessments on performance of the, of the infrastructure. These are just some pictures of examples of, of different uh, attributes that we keep track of, and the colors represent numbers of, of uh, you know, how many lanes or, or how wide the shoulders are or surface type, that sort of thing. And as you can see, with some of these uh, geometries, they can get pretty complex. Uh, this is an example of a, a grade-separated traffic interchange. Uh, as you can see, the main line flows through and there's characteristics represented there via the various colors, uh, as well as the ramp structures, which connect uh, a divided highway to, uh, to uh, you know, non-divided roadways through a great separation. Then we get into, um, you know, concept of assets and assets are a little bit different. Uh, they're, they're similar to the RCI. Um, but these these uh, th th these items typically have a significant uh, monetary value to them, um, and and a, and a particular 
uh, cost to maintain. Um, the number of miles of pavement are, you know, can be calculated. You can get estimates as to how much that's worth. Uh, bridges have monetary values. They cost a lot to maintain. Um, and essentially these, these assets are things we're uh, really needing to keep track of because of the monetary value and budgeting uh, required to, you know, to make sure we have enough resources to, to keep them in good functional condition. So pavement, um, pavement is probably one of the more important ones. And with that, we, we um, continuously measure and assess the, the condition of it. Uh, it's collected in, in, with a, a, something called a profiler. And based on the data collected, we assign a good fair poor or good fair, poor fair rating. Uh, uh, and it's basically a composite score of, of um, three, three uh, different data items. Um, you can see some of what, what's up there as far as the IRI is international roughness index and you know, things like cracking and rutting is like the grooves that uh, uh, continuous traffic uh, basically impresses into the into the pavement. Uh, and none of those things are good. Uh, you don't want rough pavement. You don't want cracking pavement, so on and so forth. Uh, so, so we measure that and we map it out and we can see where problem areas are. Uh, some of the other things we keep track of that are um, pretty important is, is, is the signs throughout the, the right away. Um, you know, if you, if you drive down any roadway, you're, you're going to see multitudes of signs. Some facilities have more signs than others, depending on their facility type. Um, but you can imagine there's, there's literally tens of thousands of signs uh, located along the roadways uh, throughout a state. And, and it's a lot to keep track of. Um, some of the other things we, keep track of is obviously bridges, as you can see in the picture there, um, the, the, the Jersey rail or barriers, and that's just a different type of barrier, Jersey rail. And you can see it transitions to a positive, more positive structure like a concrete Jersey. And all of those are uh, assets that we, we must keep track of and, uh, you know, basically keep an account of so we can prepare for monetarily uh, keep them in good working condition and a safe operating condition. Um, a photo log is uh, one of the ways we uh, can view at a micro level um, view of, of, of a transportation corridor. Uh, we even have uh, downward facing cameras that take pictures of the road and we can see where there's cracks uh, forming in the pavement and it helps us get a good understanding of what is actually the problem when we see a good fair pour. What, what is it What is it specifically that's um, failing on that particular uh, piece of pavement? Uh, traffic is uh, um, probably one of the, the more challenging aspects of what a DOT does, keeping track of it. It is probably the, it is the most uh, dynamic aspect of what happens on a roadway because traffic is constant, doesn't stop. Um, so one of the things we do is, um, is count number of vehicles traveling on the roadway. And largely it's, it's really important to understand the volumes on your roadway so you can understand how well the road is performing. Uh, you can inform uh, planning processes to potentially address um, roadway facilities that aren't functioning at, at a sufficient level. Um, and it's also an indication of, of uh, reliability of, of that roadway. Uh, is it, you know, if, if you're going to plan a route through it, can you expect to get through there in a reasonable amount of time? Or is it so unreasonable that you can't plan effectively for how long it's going to take? So besides the actual volume, we, we uh, collect uh, um, uh, the vehicle classifications. And this is just a, a picture of the Federal Highways uh, vehicle class. And it's, it's rather, 
extensive in terms of how many trucks. As you can see, there's more classifications for trucks than anything else. Uh, Multi-unit trailers, single units, buses, trailers, uh, you, you name it, even motorcycles are on there. And, and, and that's something that we, we do um, keep track of primarily because uh, trucks have a, a much higher uh, uh, deterioration effect on, on, on pavement. So understanding how many of those we have traveling our roadways is important for uh, planning purposes. Uh, some of the other things that traffic feeds is, uh, you know, re real-time travel conditions. Um, uh, pretty much every urban area, every state DOT has a 511 system. Um, I think maybe Alaska is probably the only one that does not. I'm not sure about that, but um, uh, typically this this is a uh, uh, provided by by the state DOT to everyone uh, within their states. The website uh, you can go see current travel times. You can see if there's any uh, crashes uh, or weather alerts, you know, so on and so forth. There could be um, uh, anything that's affecting the, the performance of that roadway at any given time. Uh, our system in Arizona, we have uh, basically cameras on the roadway, so you can actually go see traffic. Uh, see how it's, you know, flowing or, or not flowing in many cases, but uh, it's, it's pretty cool to go and just peruse the, the state looking at the traffic camps. Um, another major aspect of what we do with the DOT is, is uh, uh, safety related. And uh, one of the key items that we collect is uh, crashes. So for every uh, crash that happens in the state, uh, there's a basically a police report filled out uh, about who, what, and where, when, ha you know, happened, uh, crash severity, um, where we're required by federal highways to report all, all fatal and serious uh, crashes to the federal government on a monthly basis. And uh, that's, that's also ties into some health records and the Department of Health has uh, basically a, a, a database they keep of, of all the injuries that occur as a result of a, of a crash. And this data is then used uh, for, for the purposes of determining things like crash rates and hotspot analysis to, to identify where our, our problem areas are and try to uh, prioritize fixes for that. Uh, law enforcement also uses it for uh, identifying areas where they can, they can improve their law enforcement activities. You know, the cliche of just outside the bar after hours, uh, so you can get the drunk drivers off the road kind of thing. Uh, that's a little bit more to it than that, but uh, the, there, there's some data to help them target areas with, with limited resources. Um, one of the things that we're now being asked of by Federal Highways is, is, is basically collecting uh, data called the model inventory roadway elements and it's a pretty extensive database i believe there's 206 different data items that we're supposed to collect on all public roads um, 38 of them are mandatory where the others are optional so with all this data we uh we have uh, uh federal reporting requirements uh, HPMS is part of my job title, uh, but it, it really stands for Highway, Highway Performance Monitoring System. And that annual report goes to uh, federal highways and they in turn um, take it and put it into a national report for Congress. Uh, Congress uses it to do federal dollar apportionment for, for uh, federal dollars in transportation. And as a result, we, the state DOTs, get the money from federal highways to then uh, use to build and maintain our roadways. And in the case of Arizona, we distribute a lot of it to um, uh, to cities, towns, and counties to, to build and maintain their their own roads. So, ADOT, Arizona DOT, is is largely a pass through of funding. I think we get about two two and a half billion dollars a year, of which um, the state only retains about 400 million of it, so most of it actually goes to local agencies. Um, 
the all public road or all road network of linear reference data uh, is is supportive of HPMS. It's the definition of of the roadway network. It could also refer to our be referred to as the linear referencing system, which I, I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, the certified public miles is is an accounting of how many miles the state has, and every state DOT is required to provide that uh, federal highways with the uh, the state's governor signing off on it, uh, basically certifying that this is how many miles of road the state has. Um, some something else that we do here is the is the, the state highway system log, which gives a pretty detailed um, description of, of what what's going on on our roadway. Uh, typically, civil engineers will use it to help help um, do cost estimates for for particular roadway improvement uh, projects. Um, Something else, extend and travel, which is a product of HPMS, uh, and that basically gives uh, gives us length of roadway, uh, something called lane miles, which is length times number of lanes, and then uh, that length and lane miles multiplied by traffic volume, so we can see how many uh, cars are traveling on a roadway on, on a typical day and it's, it's quite amazing how many cars travel our roadways. Uh, in some cases, we have 280,000 cars going around one corner of uh, one road in, 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 in Phoenix here. So uh, other things like paved report card just gives an overview of the current health of our, of our pavement. Uh, in this case, what you're seeing here is just for the interstates for Arizona. Uh, we have pretty good roads, but uh, they could be better. Uh, some other things we've done with reporting is uh, um, basically create dashboards that lets uh, people who are curious about what our roadway conditions are delve into the data on their own and they can uh, do some self-discovery. Uh, it, it also allows for decision makers to uh, uh, easily go find out answers to their own questions and uh, get the answers much more timely than uh, they would otherwise by having to ask a, a professional to go figure out some of the questions that they have. Uh, something else we do is uh, forecasting. Um, the travel demand model essentially is a tool by which uh, take capacity, you know, what is the maximum capacity of a roadway, what are the current traffic flows, uh, what are uh, some of the demographics, uh, like socioeconomic information from the census? Uh, the system uh, basically mixes all those things together and projects where and what uh, the roadway conditions are going to look like in the future. Uh, so 50 years is probably a little bit too far to be accurate, but the system does go out 50 years. Uh, it, it, probably reliable for about 10 to 15 years, depending on the type of facility it's looking at, but at least lets us have some predictive model to uh, see where the greatest need is for expansion of uh, current facilities is, and it uh, uh, lets us prioritize our projects in that way. Uh, the pavement data that we collect is also used for um, predicting deterioration rates of, uh, of pavement. Uh, from the graph there, you can see the difference between not maintaining a roadway and doing maintenance on it, at least as a projection into the future. Um, and it basically keeps the DOTs from um, using the mentality of we'll, we'll fix the worst roadways first instead of maybe fixing something that isn't that bad, but in, in doing that, in fixing it when it's not that bad, you get another 10 to 15 years of, of life out of it instead of only uh, 10, uh, you know, 10 short years. So it's a, it's a way of prior, prioritizing a limited amount of, uh, of funding to keep the roadway surface in good condition. And then we have some, I, I, I consider these, these items uh, supporting data items because it's not data that uh, uh, the DOT would maintain, um, uh, even though I do have engineering construction plans up there, they, they come to us not in a 
GIS format, so we have to do a lot of conversion. Um, but but everything from the census data, and these are just some examples. There's there's a there's an exhaustive list of other data items that we use from from outside sources. But uh, um, our state land department uh, maintains our county boundaries, city and town boundaries. There's land ownership, and there's quite a bit more that they do. Um, environmental. Uh, when planning a roadway, it's very important to understand your hydrology so you can build proper drainage uh, systems to accommodate water. Uh, you don't want to go on across the roadway because that's bad for drivers. Um, also, wildlife and things that are planned for, for um, uh, migration uh, corridors, uh, we support that in Arizona. I think we have little tunnels for something called the Gila Monster here. and uh, basically lets the lizards cross the road without getting run over. And that is essentially the presentation. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Uh, if you don't have any now, you can certainly reach out to me via email or phone, and I would be happy to do so. Thank you so much. Um, this time we Thank can you. open it up to any questions. Anyone has any? Bridget, this is Jamie. I have a question. Sure. James, thanks for the presentation. This is interesting. Um, you know, as you were talking about the different attributes that you can, you know, attribute to the different features, um, you know, I started thinking about um, accident-related information. Um, is this a, an attribute that you keep for um, your various uh, geospatial features, or is that outside the realm of DOT? And then if you do keep it, um, is it something that informs planning, um, also um, routes, um, you know, new road development, those types of things? Yeah, so, so for crashes and safety related items and particularly crashes we we are required to, to do that and uh, we've built systems data systems that uh, help facilitate that data collection from uh, law enforcement as they as they um, you know collect that information in the field um, it, it comes up to ADOT and then we can use it for the the safety planning process uh, identifying hot spots and um, you know, also leads us to needing more and more data in particular cases if there's a, what they, they call it a corridor study, um, where it gets into a pretty detailed level of analysis of um, a particular facility that's, that's being seen or, or analyzed as a, um, not a safe part of our roadway network. Uh, and then they assess whether or not it's an engineering related problem or is it a insufficient signage related problem or is there some other um, social sociological issue that's going on there like it's near a, a um, I don't know a, a college campus and lots of bars that sort of thing does that answer your question it does thank you sure. hey Jim this is Karen I have a question sure so how is the location information for an accident recorded? Is it by an XY like latitude longitude or is it tied to an address? Uh, it's um, right now it's, it's basically an X and Y location. Uh, this is, this is true for most of the law enforcement in Arizona. They have a system on board with the G, you know, basically has a GPS and as they create a report, the, point at which the vehicle is is, is stored uh, and that that basically becomes the accident location um, I know that sounds like it's probably a little bit inaccurate and there are some inaccuracies with with the current methodology um, but we're basically asking officers to collect a whole bunch of, of, of data really quickly and get the road back open to free-flowing traffic as quickly as possible so um, some some you know compromise has you know has to be made to make that process quick. Uh, we do get the occasional issue where uh, 
of reports seem to be filled out in the same location, stacked on one another in a uh, parking lot somewhere. Um, that that does happen. Uh, we do then post process the data, so it gets uh, it gets put through a process called geocoding, where that X and Y is then converted into a route and uh, mile post type location information. Uh, addressing would be a, eventually a, an ideal one for, for non-state facilities, uh, just to give a secondary um, location information that, that we wouldn't otherwise be able to support. But currently, there's not enough addressing data for us to support that. So. And is, I understand that's how it's done in Arizona, but is there any consistency as to how um, accident locations are reported across the country? Do all states do it differently? Yeah, I would say uh, they're, they're all done slightly differently. To more or less degree, Arizona is pretty consistent with most states. Um, I know as you get into more rural areas of the country, um, the technology that's needed to do this is is not it's not the same as an urban you know a densely packed urban area, um, and you know paper serves the process fine. It just creates a more error potentiality uh, and more inaccuracies. Uh, I, I know some states do a lot better than what we do. Uh, an ideal process would be that uh, we have all these data systems that support the crash report, where the officer would potentially just drop a pin on a map where he thinks uh, he or she thinks that the accident occurred and the GPS kind of just serves as a, a general location tool that it gets the, the officer's view of the, the area in, into a, a micro level, small scale view and then places that crash and then all of the information about the roadway, uh, the road name, uh, how many lanes, what's the speed limit, uh, even even the current weather conditions are auto populated uh, from the data that, that's that's readily available, and uh, then the officer only has to focus on the people involved and not so much as what the conditions of the roadway are. That would be more of an ideal approach, and, and Arizona is going to be moving towards that type of solution hopefully in the near future. Great, thanks. I have several questions about HPMS, if we're ready to move on. Sure. So I assume that federal dollars are tied to successful HPMS reporting. Yes. So in other words, states uh, don't... More, yeah, in more than one way. Yeah, go ahead. So states don't get their money until they submit their HPMS reports. Uh, not quite. Um, so, so if so if the state does not do an HBMS report, federal highways will not withhold funds, but they will come into the state and say, "This is how you are spending your funds." So the state is removed from the choice of what this money spent on. Hmm. It's not fair to the citizens of the state to be penalized for the state government's. Uh, in that institute, so the federal highways will come in and, and do it for them. Okay. And so the federal, federal reporting requirements, are they all tied to only state and federal highways? In other words, are state DOTs only really required to maintain, you know, an accurate database in, um, of state and federal highways across their state? Uh, so within the, the HPMS world, there's a, a, a terminology called the federal aid system. And the federal aid system pertains to any roadway facility that's eligible for, for federal funds. And there's something called a functional classification. And um, the top, top of the classification is interstate. So that's number one, that's where most money gets spent. Uh, but at the very bottom, there's something called local roads, and those would be considered residential streets. And typically, residential streets are the only thing that are not eligible for federal funds. 
Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Can you tell me how it works um, in states that have indigenous tribes? Um, you know, my, like my understanding, in Wyoming is we have a separate DOT on our reservation. How does that work, and how does coordination work between those? Sure. Um, pardon a moment while I take a sip of water. I'm getting dry throat here. Um, so, so typically the the tribal nations will. Um, uh, interact with the DOTs through a regional government, uh, either a metropolitan planning organization or a, count, a, a county or a council of governments, which usually typically addresses uh, more rural parts. Uh, typically the tribe will be uh, one of the members of, of one of those regional bodies and that's where they voice their concerns. Uh, that's how uh, the, the money that gets passed through to the local agencies gets distributed at, at that level. Um, however, I would also say that tribes in particular have um, the um, Bureau, Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is a federal agency, part of the uh, Department of Interior, and they have other um, avenues by which to obtain funding for their roadways uh, besides that of the FHWA dollars passing through the state DOT. So do they have HPMS reporting requirements as well? Uh, they do, um, but it's usually handled by uh, the federal agencies, uh, whereas this, this is kind of um, odd to say, but we get data from the federal government to report back to the federal government. So um, it's kind of like a round robin reporting cycle with, with how it works, but that's essentially what we do with, uh, with, with tribal lands as well as like Forest Service and um, anything else that's, that's uh, managed by the Department of Interior. Okay. I know it sounds weird, but it's, it's the way it works. Well, I guess the question is, does it work? Uh, to some degree. <laughs> it's, it's, something, it's something that needs to be improved. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say the trouble that state DOTs have with tribal nations is that uh, uh, they, we, we have no real way of requiring them to do anything. So um, it's usually on goodwill alone that gets anything done. I'll take a break if anybody else has questions. I'd jump in if, if um, we have time for a few more. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, I'm. I guess my curiosity is is also how. Um, information is passed up and down the hierarchy chain. So, Jim, the work you do at the state, you know, how that goes up, you know, what the, the federal government is interested in, what data they use of yours, how you collaborate and share with them. And then similarly, going down the chain, how local governments use, you know, all of the, the work that you do as well. Maybe you could just comment on that. Sure. So some of the other uses besides federal dollar apportionment at the, at the federal level is the um, Bureau of Transportation Statistics takes all of the data from the states as it, you know, as it's collected and basically builds a national um, performance report card or conditions and uh, that way you know they can do some some informative infographics about you know the, the, the country's uh, transportation infrastructure uh, it's it's pretty informative it's uh, I think it's bts.gov if anyone wants to go or at least 
you can Google Bureau of Transportation Statistics and go see some of their publications. And, and it's, that, that's essentially where the data gets used at the federal level um, from, from the state. Um, as far as the local agencies using it, um, it really depends on the local agency. Uh, a lot of them maintain their own data, especially if they're large urban areas. Uh, how well they do it varies. Um, there's, there's, a, there's, there's probably a great need to do more coordination with the local agencies to, you know, collaborate and not duplicate efforts. Um, but at the same time, we're, you know, this, our, my state is not um, very well staffed, and we don't necessarily have enough resources to talk to everyone all the time. Uh, the local levels have a lot of turnover, um, and essentially we only ask for a few data items from the local governments, tra traffic being one of the, the most significant, because that's, that's basically used in every bit of the planning process. Uh, it's used at the local planning process, um, uh, and, and then crashes. Those, those are, you know, I would say crashes are a, a byproduct of traffic, so it's kind of lumped together in the same type of data, it's, it's dynamic. Um, uh, but as far as how much the local agencies use, what we produce is it's, it, it really depends on the agency itself. Great, thank you. Sure. So Jim, another question for you looking ahead, how do you think that technology such as autonomous vehicles will affect state DOTs? Oh, that's, a, that's a really good question because I, I don't think there's anyone in DOTs that actually knows the answer to that question. Um, we, all we know is it's gonna disrupt everything. Um, it's, it's probably gonna change a lot of how we manage our, our, our traffic. Um, some, there's something called edge computing, uh, where the connected vehicles, the autonomous vehicles, are, are connected to uh, computing systems at the edge of the roadway, essentially. And uh, for instance, if there's a issue on the roadway, uh, the, the computing systems can relay that information to the uh, upstream vehicles in, in milliseconds. Like, I think, I think what I've heard is like 10 updates a second. So every tenth of a second, there's a broadcasted update to the, to the vehicle system. Uh, thus, you know, all of the vehicles will start slowing down and you don't have, you know, a whole bunch of rear end accidents as a result of, uh, of an incident up, upstream from the traffic. Uh, that would be a type of effect. And, but, but autonomous vehicles, it's, it's going to be a slow phase and you're going to have people who are resistant to it. Um, there's a driving culture that still exists in the United States and people still like to drive their cars. Uh, and then it, it's clashing with the culture who would rather not have to drive their cars. So for, I see, I foresee for decades to come, we're going to have mixed driving and potentiality of having separate travel lanes for, for autonomous and non-autonomous vehicles. But it's it's gonna it's gonna be a game changer for for a lot of things, including how we collect data. I think the cars are gonna self-report. You know, look, I'm here, I'm I'm one vehicle, and we're not gonna have to have intrusive uh, technology that uh, looks for the vehicles and um, counts them, that sort of thing. Does that answer it? Yeah, it's very interesting. Thank you. Sure. Okay, any more questions? I could go on for hours, but in the <laughs> interest of keeping it shorter, I'll stop there. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much, Jim, for joining us today um, and for being here for another one of our GIS 101 sessions. And thank you all who joined the call and we will see you next time. Thank you. Great, thank happy you. to do it. thank you. <laughs>